and say, uh, I thought that blue sky is really not indicative of <laughs> our experience in Taiwan. Um, so just for those who don't know, I'm a member of the Association of Certificated Field Archaeologists, or ACFA, which has been on the go for about 30 years. Um, most of the members have completed a course at Glasgow University's Department of Continuing Education in Field Archaeology, which is good old-fashioned drawing boards, offset teeth and drawing sites. Um, we've published about 130 occasional papers um, and they can range from anything from a prehistoric site to the latest, which was a flint mill in Glasgow's River Kelvin. So a big range of interests in the society. So this is Tyree. <laughs> um, uh, behind the Kilman Garden, is a sort of typical Tyree house. And for those who've been there, you'll know that Tyree's a little bit different from some of the other heavy green islands. It feels a little bit different, and the built architecture looks a little bit different. Um, the roofs are quite tall and sort of traditionally set on top of their stone footings back a little bit to create a shelf. And in the summer, animals used to sun themselves in the shelf. And, dogs and things like that, and originally these roofs would have been thatched, um, and now they're sort of tarred or bitumen. Um, but it's a very small island, it's only about 12 miles by 4 miles, and the highest hill, you don't really get the impression of uh, how flat Tyree is from that photograph, but the highest hill is about 460 feet, so it's a very flat island, and the leaf in the middle of the island is pretty much at uh, sea level. So the origins of the survey were really in a field visit in 2015, which Wendy Ray organised, and we had a great time talking about all the Eskin Berry sites. And we met Dr. John Holliday, who's um, the local doctor, and in his spare time, he's been collecting place names and uh, local myths and so on and so forth. And he's particularly interested in the Norse names of Tyree, and he thinks he's discovered about 180 Norse names, which is a lot for an island that small. So it suggests that the settlement in the Norse Viking period was quite significant, but today there's been no settlement evidence to support his thesis. A little bit of archaeology, but no settlement evidence. So we were quite interested and thought we could maybe, maybe help with this. And uh, Heather James from North Light Heritage got involved. Um, and she worked with us on our survey and also with John and organising an archaeology week. Um, and it was a great success. Uh, it coincided with the half marathon, so people were running, we were surveying, and then there was a Kiwi, and it was a pretty, pretty full on five days. But, uh, and as all of you will know, when a lot is concentrated in uh, one area, a lot of energy, um, things bubble to the surface, and just as Heather and she also invited Colleen Beatty, who's a Norse specialist, and uh, David Caldwell, formerly of the National Museums of Scotland, in to give talks. And just as they were leaving the island, uh, they revisited a site that was known about it, but is now being uh, reassessed. Uh, we can't talk a lot about it because uh, we're looking for funding and things like that, but uh, could have banking a woman in it. Um, so that was great. Um, so, uh, lots of uh, local people, holidaymakers, joined us on our survey. This gentleman here was, sorry, that gentleman there was very keen to go on site with, with Heather, he was determined to get there. Um, and this was up on Baldfield, which is in the southwest of the island. And that's Flora. Flora was great because she was born in Baldfield. So she came on site, and it was really nice having her at one end and us in the middle and then having people like Heather and Green Beatty at the other. And so you really got to see a site in the round. She had lots of local knowledge and local stories uh, to tell about Battlefield. So just a little bit of, is this the red? How do I get a red light? Underneath. This one? Oh, okay, okay, that's it. Sorry. Just a little bit of context for Tyree in, this, in the period that we were interested in. Uh, this is just a sketch, so Norway looks a little bit close. 
But if, if, if in the Norse period you were going to perhaps be sailing west and south from Norway or Orkney and Shetland and coming down into the Irish Sea Basin and then on into the banking port of Dublin, and you can see that Tyree and Call are quite significant in their location. So there's a lot of uh, influence flowing down this sort of sea road past the islands and then um, coming back up again. And the Isle of Man is a big player, as most of you will probably know in this region, in the Viking Norse period. The kings of uh, Man and the Isles are um, competing with the Jarls of Orkney um, for overlordship in the area. Um, and not forgetting if you were to come west from Inverness down the Bray Glen to pretty much where we are today, and follow the line of the Calmac Ferry North, you'll, you'll hit coal. coal. So coal's quite significant uh, locationally. And both islands are to mention in, in Viking sagas, so they're sort of packing a big punch for their size in the period. Um, this is some of John's work. Uh, one of the reasons the Vikings would probably have been interested in um, Tyree was it was very fertile. It was probably the most fertile of all the Hebridean islands. Um, and John thinks he's identified quite a few place names that suggest a primary Norse farm site on the island. It doesn't mean to say that there was a Norse or Viking farm there, but it suggests that there, there might have been uh, some Norse influence. And we know that in Tyree, um, it had upwards of perhaps 25 ounceland. Now, an ounceland is a land assessment that, uh, system that probably dates back to the Norse period. Um, so, 25 ounceland is quite a lot. And an ounceland is nominally an ounce of silver, but really it's, it's how much a land can, can produce in tanks and cattle and things like that. So, we know that Tyree was very highly regulated and it was probably this sort of aggressive land assessment was the biggest effect on the island uh, in the Norse period. Um, what we don't know really is how that fits into what went before with the Pictish Javok and, and how land was apportioned, but, but we do know um, that, that Tyree was um, of great interest in this period because of its fertility. Um, so these are some of the place names that John discovered or or has analysed on Tyree. And it's not just names like Ness and um, Headland that you might apply, you know, as you're saying by or locational name. Um, but it's also simplex names like Bag and Hole. Now Bag basically means base. So if you were arriving for the first time and perhaps establishing a farm there, it might be the farm at the base. So that's a very settlement is suggested by names like that. Um, but other names that such as those contained in Barrack Hall, which suggests a farmstead, and not just a farmstead that's um, just appeared, perhaps one that's um, developed on <coughs> another primary site. So a lot of place name evidence to suggest this Norse influence on, on Tyree. Um, and interesting, the name Tervis uh, is a Norse name for Tyree, but the name Tyree itself is a lot earlier. It's probably pre-Gallic. Um, but uh, the name that people from Tyree still use to call themselves comes from that Norse form. So that has something interesting to say about um, how people regard themselves culturally. So uh, as I was saying, in terms of archaeology, most of it's stray finds associated with graves, a pair of tortoise brooches, um, an adult male disarticulated skeleton in uh, the Brockett Fall, um, and a little bit of pottery, which is quite significant. Tiny is one of the southern areas for finding Hebridean Viking uh, pottery, so there's not a lot there, but enough to make it important. Um, and Viking pottery at this period, there's a lot of continuity with what goes before in terms of uh, what they're using and how they're making it. Um, but the style is slightly different in smaller bowls and cups. Um, and later on, these Hebridean platters that are sort of grass marked with finger marks on them and things like that. Um, so, so the archaeology is supporting the place name evidence. Um, 
But the big problem for Tyree, for archaeologists, or anyone trying to look into its past, is the sand bowl. It's suffered very badly from sand bowl over several generations now. And this, this is the land lost um, to school, sorry, pardon? Uh, lost uh, to uh, Tyree um, by 1768. So you can see the West Coast is particularly affected. And this is a 1768 map drawn from the Duke of Burgau. The fifth Duke was a great improving Duke and he was trying to improve uh, the output and productivity of the island and, and everyone was aware that it was a landscape under stress by this period and James Turnbull maps all these little townships um, along the west coast and if you, if you can look really carefully you can see little red dots of all the little houses and within a generation they're gone they're completely um, abandoned and Hall, which is just out of shot, it moves over the other side of the hill here. Um, so it's a landscape under stress, and a, a lot of the Norse archaeology you would expect probably to be in these coastal areas. Um, so we had to think out of the box a little bit about where we're going to start the survey, and we decided to um, target three zones. Um, the river at Bag, um, rocks and then the periphery or marginal land. Um, we were interested in the river at Bag because there is some evidence that it's just a stream now because of the sand, but there's some evidence that uh, in the earlier period it was quite a substantial river or possibly even a tidal inlet. Um, and there are three Norse place names at Bag uh, Nokebrig, Dunedbrig, and Dusbrig. Um, a break can mean a bridge or a fort, but it also can suggest a landing place. And Deuce Break is on the coast, but the, the dune is, and the knock, they're inland, and you can't see the sea from where they are. So that makes us wonder if they're referencing a landing place further up. And in the 16th century, Tyree's described as have been a good haven for highland galleys. Now, it could be referring to the beach it got, um, but it might also be referring to this area here. So we wanted to have a look at it. We could only feel what this season because of um, nesting birds, but it's something that we'll probably go back to. Um, in terms of the locks, you can see in this map, as uh, below, that uh, the little tadpoles are all connected to the sea and now they're completely landlocked. But we put good evidence for, in the medieval period and earlier, uh, boats being overwintered in the locks. Um, so we were interested in, for example, the headland over one of these locks. And this is a Viking ship canal at Skye. It's a much more impressive <coughs> structured site. But, um, so there's evidence that these locks might have been used for this sort of activity. Um, so these are, these are the sites that we looked at. Um, the GIS is done by Ollie Rusk, who's a postgrad at Glasgow University. Um, so we were up at Balfetrish here, at Hoe. That's where the little township was that moved over the other side of the hill. Uh, down at the headland at Kenavara, above one of the logs, above the fuel. And then down at Hainish, which is the uh, marginal land, and we were interested in Hainish because the dune there, its name, uh, means fort of the shield in Norse. And one of the best examples of a Norse period house comes from the Isle of Man, which was excavated in the 1970s, and it, um, it was found in marginal land that in the Norse period it was probably a permanent settlement went on to be a shooting later on. So we thought, given our problems with the sand, it would be nice to look at some of the marginal sites. Um, so one of the first ones we looked at was uh, at uh, Balfe Trish, and it's marked in Canmore as being a possible church or a Norse house. Um, and that's Above, you can see the, the drawing of the house in the Isle of Man. So at first sight, it does look very similar. You've got the opposing doors, and you have evidence of benches here. And so this, this looked very promising. 
Um, but when we got on site and drew it up, um, we pretty early on all agreed it wasn't a church. And David Caldwell and Cree Beatty came and had a look, and they're pretty sure in its present form it's not Norse either. Um, but uh, and it's definitely not a church because although it's got an east to west um, configuration, it's, there's a lot of rake and other activity. Um, and I think I think what we're the, the, there was a slight disagreement between Colleen and David as to whether it was medieval or later. Uh, so I think what we're looking at in Tyree is, is a long history of, of house styles and settlement. It doesn't change very much in an island its size. So you're talking about from the long house tradition, perhaps in the Viking period, right the way through to the black house and beyond. There's only very subtle changes going on in the settlement evidence. Um, and something that could, could be quite modern can look old because it can sink down in the sand a little bit. But it doesn't mean to say that there isn't something older underneath. So it would be really lovely if we stack some money to, to, to try and date this house and then we can use it as a comparison to, to everything else. But it's a lovely, lovely site. And that's the team that um, that's the team that drew it. That's Holly and Wendy and uh, Alison are here today. Here. Um, and there's a rainstone, I don't know if anyone has ever been there, but it's a big erratic with you know, cut on it and you can hit it and it dings. So it's a fantastic site, beautiful location. Um, so another, another, another uh, site we did was at Hope. Um, and again, this is, this is in the area where um, the township had to move to the other side of the hill. And we, we drew a hole up, it's on the, on the marker, and the site is not, it's not shown in the, in the Turnbull map, um, 1768 Turnbull map, and it doesn't appear in modern maps either, the first edition maps. So either it's earlier than Turnbull, or perhaps it just appeared very briefly between these two periods of time. Maybe somebody's trying to make a go of it when the main township moved over the hill. But we don't know. But again, you can see that if you look at this site, it could be earlier than 1768. But there's not a lot of difference between it and uh, a house at Sandig, which is 19th century. And you can see it's the main house and the bar and the buyer. So there's a, a sort of very distinct, tidy style, these very thick, deep, dull skin walls and slightly bold. And also, we seem to go in for uh, triangular enclosures, which seem to be another kind of tiny house style. We don't know why. John Holiday likes to think it goes back to the sort of Viking sacred triangular spiritual enclosures, but I don't know about that. They appear in some modern buildings as well. Um, so, this is at Kenabara, and this is our first real big success. We're really chuffed with this. Um, it, one of the buildings in Kenavara was down as an ancient dwelling in Canmore with not much else said about it. Um, and we found two and we drew them up and David came and had a look and he said that he's pretty confident to call it medieval. So we're really pleased. We think this is the first properly attested medieval house in Tyree. Um, uh, I'm just coming in behind uh, Kenavara, you can see the headland of Heinish, and Heinish ended up being the doozy of them all, to be honest. Uh, uh, it's that old archaeological adage that you always find what you're not looking for. So on Heinish, we think we have surveyed a rubbed out stone circle, which it only survives in one arm, but it's about 28 metres in diameter. We have surveyed probably one round curved cairn, possibly found a, a second rubbed out curved cairn, numerous little farmsteads, lazy beds, uh, footings for round huts, in total 40 features, 15 discrete sites in five days, and we've probably only done about a quarter of the entire site, so it's packed with archaeology. Um, of multi -cave. so we're really, really pleased with the site. Do we surveyed it? We had to kind of prize his fingers off the drawing board. We didn't want to 
didn't want to depart. Um, so no, it's a great site. So not really marginal land in that sense. I think for millennia, people have been living and working up there, sometimes temporarily, sometimes uh, permanently. So a great site. And uh, that's just one of the little um, the little dwellings up, and the, the fort of the shield is just to the right of that. Um, little round up fittings. Um, and this is the GIS cluster map. You see there's a big concentration down in Hamish. Now that's partly because of preservation and, and the conditions, so it's kind of skewed, but, but, but a fantastic site. Um, so the future, we hope to go back um, in October and then in April, and we'd like to start a sort of more comprehensive field survey um, of the settlement on Tyree. And we're not calling it medieval or, um, or uh, Viking um, for obvious reasons, but we do hope that if we can build up a really good picture of all the, all the, the um, substantial archaeology that's in the island, then we can get a little cog in helping towards further investigation. Because I think Tyree could be really important for everyday Viking archaeology if we can get at it. Uh, the quote there is from Ollie Rusk in his paper that he's about to uh, hand in to Glasgow University, and he says that the island could be an example of unique innovations born from indigenous contacts. So what he's meaning is that in an island the size of Tyree, the relationship between uh, incomer and residents would be very subtle and complex because it's a very, very small island. So perhaps they, if we can get to some settlement archaeology of the 10th, 11th century, we can understand this relationship. It's something that's a lot less clear and a little bit different to what we're finding in places like the, the US and uh, in Orkney and Shetland, where you're getting much more a different kind of interaction. So um, this is Jack. Jack Frost, or the Viking you know, Frosty, because yes, it was April, and we were snowed in in Tyree for a day. <laughs> Partly Tyree's so flat that the roads disappear when it snows, but who knew because it never snows there. So they gave away the snow plow, so Dave <laughs> Caldwell um, and uh, Colleen and two of our site directors had to get taxied up from Glasgow and take brought over, so it was all a bit of a nightmare. So I don't know what his appearance says about our future prospects in the island, but... Uh, Anyway, thanks very much.